Hey there, my freshmen. Thank you for your hard work on our symbolism activity today. I hope you noticed that last slide uh, in our symbolism PowerPoint that had to do with a couple of things to look forward to for the man. Specifically, we want to look for point of view, um, as well as some things that might be symbolic in the story as we read. If you haven't watched our exposition video yet, or if you um, weren't here in class for A Group, where we actually read the first couple of pages of The Man, I encourage you to watch that video first. You'll see that in, our, in this lesson folder if you need it. Otherwise, you'll want to watch through The Man Part 1, where we'll start on page 3 and read five-ish pages today to gear up for finishing the story next week. Um, I'll do my best to point out literary elements as we read, but I want to be mindful of time as well. Please know that I'm going to open up some time in our lesson on Monday. So A group while you're here, or on Monday, sorry, on Tuesday uh, slash Wednesday. So A group while you're here in person, we'll be able to do that in person. For B group uh, in our next video, I'll be sure to discuss those important elements as you guys watch. That being said, let's dive into the man, starting from page three. Oh, I forgot something too. Let me look back at our agenda here. Uh, upcoming, so on Monday, Monday we're just going to use as an overlap day in here. I'm going to do my best to keep contact with you guys and make sure we're getting missing work in. Next, uh, Tuesday, Wednesday, we'll finish reading and discussing our story, discussing its meaning especially. I'm also going to build a review game for us to review for our short stories unit test, which is coming at the end of next week. That is the end of our grading period. Let's, finish, or let's continue in The Man by Ray Bradbury. If you guys are watching the video right now, again, please remember to keep a special focus on point of view and symbolism. I'll do my best to point out other literary elements as we watch. I'm just going to view this in another tab. Each of you is getting a copy in class as well, or should already have a copy, so you can read on paper if you like, or you can just follow these videos or read virtually to read this story. We're going to be covering five pages or so today. So. In our exposition video, we discussed what we know from the beginning of this story. Exposition usually gives us characters, setting, and conflict. Um, as a reminder, the characters we've met so far are Captain Hart and Martin. We see them right here. The captain is very much a brash, very serious, um, almost angry man. Martin's a lot more calm and level-headed, so we know those two main characters so far. Setting-wise, um, we know that we are on a distant planet, probably in the distant future. They are space explorers, and they've landed on, on this planet. They don't know the name of this planet, and we're never quite given its name. Conflict-wise, the strange thing for these two men is that they've landed their rocket on this planet. Everyone saw them land, and no one came out to see them. They're not used to that as space explorers. Usually when they land on a planet, people come out to greet them, or they're terrified of them. And here, no one has done anything, and they're wondering, hey, what gives? The last thing we found is that um, Martin comes back from the city. He's asked around to see what's going on. And what we've learned is that apparently they've landed at an inopportune time. Little vocabulary connection there. It means that they've landed at the wrong time. Um, apparently something big, even bigger than a spaceship landing has happened recently. And the people of the city on this unknown planet really don't care about their rocket. We're going to find out why as we read today. Let's keep going. Starting in page three, Martin was patient. Captain, listen. Something big happened yesterday in that city. It's so big, so important, that we're second rate, second fiddle. I've got to sit down. He lost his balance and sat heavily, gasping for air. The captain chewed his, his cigar angrily. What happened? Martin lifted his head, smoke from the burning cigarette in his fingers, blowing in the wind. Sir, yesterday, in that city, a remarkable man appeared. Good, intelligent, compassionate, and infinitely wise. Notice the title connection there, the man. This is the man we're talking about. Notice that we're not given his name. The captain glared at his lieutenant. What's that to do with us? It's hard to explain, but he was a man for whom they'd waited a long time, a million years maybe. And yesterday he walked into their city. That's why today, sir, our rocket landing means nothing. The captain sat down violently. Who was it? Not Ashley. He didn't arrive in his rocket before us and steal my glory, did he? He seized Martin's arm. His face was pale and dismayed. Not Ashley, sir. Then it was Burton. I knew it. Burton stole in ahead of us and ruined my landing. You can't trust anyone anymore. Not Burton either, sir, said Martin quietly. The captain was incredulous. Another good vocab word, but it's not on our list. Incredulous means that he can't believe it. There were only three rockets. We were in the lead. This man who got here ahead of us, what was his name? 
He didn't have a name. He doesn't need one. It would be different on every planet, sir. The captain stared at his lieutenant with hard, cynical eyes. Well, what did he do that was so wonderful? Nobody even looks at our ship. For one thing, said Martin steadily, he healed the sick and comforted the poor. He fought hypocrisy and dirty politics and sat among the people, talking through the day. Is that so wonderful? Yes, Captain. I don't get this. The captain confronted, vocab connection, he approached Martin, got up in his face, peered into his face, hey look, another vocab word, and eyes. You've been drinking, eh? He was suspicious. He backed away. I don't understand. Martin looked at the city. Captain, if you don't understand, there's no way of telling you. The captain followed his gaze. The city was quiet and beautiful, and a great peace lay over it. The captain stepped forward, taking his cigar from his lips. He squinted first at Martin, then at the golden spires of the buildings. That's a good place to stop and talk setting for just a moment. In the exposition, we were introduced to this planet. Uh, they landed their rocket in a meadow. And here we get some details about the city, right? It's quiet and beautiful and, and peaceful. Martin mentioned earlier in the story that there's no peace left on Earth. So notice how this city is described too. That's just a little teeny tiny connection between setting and theme. We have to remember that all story elements connect to theme in some way. Notice the, the subject of peace in this story and how the setting, this beautiful meadow, this golden city, brings out that theme. I would suggest to you that that minor theme of peace applies pretty much throughout this story into the characters, into the setting, into the plot, into the point of view, into symbolism as we get to in our next lesson. You don't mean, you can't mean. That man you're talking about couldn't be, Martin nodded. That's what I mean, sir. The captain stood silently, not moving. He drew himself up. I don't believe it, he said at last. Another little connection here. We haven't talked about point of view in this story yet, although you did uh, learn about it a little bit in our um, notes earlier in this lesson. This story has to either be first person point of view, third person limited, or third person omniscient. It's very clearly not first person because our narrator is not uh, using the, the I voice in this. It has to be third limited or third omniscient. What we have here is a classic third limited perspective here. Notice that, that the author, Ray Bradbury, never gives us the name of this man. And we're really only seeing things through Hart and Martin's eyes. This is an example of third person limited. We see what characters are, uh, we see what characters are doing and saying. We can't see directly about what these characters are thinking. We have to make inferences here. So here, we're maybe given a little detail about who this man might be. That is one of your questions. Who does the man symbolize? I hope you can find that as we read this story. And we'll, and we'll discuss that big time in our next lesson anyway. But we're in third limited right here. We're never told directly what these characters are thinking or feeling. We can only see what they are saying and doing. They're giving us hints. They're not quite giving us everything. And that's intentional. The, the, the name of this man is supposed to be a mystery to us. And the author, Ray Bradbury, wants us to um, pick up little clues from the story as to who we think the man is. He intentionally makes third limited in order to keep this story kind of mysterious. At high noon, Captain Hart walked briskly into the city, accompanied by Lieutenant Martin and an assistant who was carrying some electrical equipment. Every once in a while, the captain laughed loudly, put his hands on his hips, and shook his head. The mayor of the town confronted him. We have confronted again, approached him. Martin set up a tripod, screwed a box onto it, and switched on the batteries. Are you the mayor? Captain, the captain jabbed a finger out. I am, said the mayor. The delicate apparatus, that's a word for machine, stood between them, controlled and adjusted by Martin and the assistant. Instantaneous translations from any language were made by the box. The words sounded crisply on the mild air of the city. About this occurrence yesterday, said the captain. It occurred? It did. You have witnesses. We have. May we talk to them? Talk to any of us, said the mayor. We are all witnesses. In an aside to Martin, the captain said, mass hallucination. To the mayor, what did this man, this stranger, look like? That would be hard to say, said the mayor, smiling a little. Why would it? Opinions might differ slightly. I'd like your opinion, sir, anyway, said the captain. Record this. He snapped to Martin over his shoulder. The lieutenant pressed the button of a hand recorder. Well, said the mayor of the city, he was a very gentle and kind man. He was of great and knowing intelligence. Once again, 
I want, I want you to pull this into the front of your head right now. Think to yourself, who does this man sound like? Who does he symbolize? Yes, yes, I know, I know. The captain waved his fingers. Generalizations. I want something specific. What did he look like? I don't believe that's important, replied the mayor. It's very important, said the captain sternly. I want a description of this fellow. If I can't get it from you, I'll get it from others. To Martin. I'm sure it must have been Burton, pulling one of his practical jokes. Martin would not look him in the face. Martin was coldly silent. The captain snapped his fingers. There was something or other, a healing. Many healings, said the mayor. May I see one? You may, said the mayor. My son. He pointed at a small boy who stepped forward. He was afflicted with a withered arm. Now look upon it. Notice that vocab connection. Withered means dead or dying or shriveled up. This boy must have had some kind of injury or handicap where his arm wasn't working, and the man healed his arm. Again, who does that sound like to you? At this, the captain laughed tolerantly. Yes, yes, this isn't even circumstantial evidence, you know. I didn't see the boy's withered arm. I only see his arm whole and well. That's no proof. What proof have you that the boy's arm was withered yesterday and today as well? My word is my proof, said the mayor simply. My dear man, cried the captain, you don't expect me to go on hearsay, do you? Oh, no. I'm sorry, said the mayor, looking upon the captain with what appeared to be curiosity and pity. Do you have any pictures of the boy before today? Asked the captain. After a moment, a large oil portrait was carried forth, showing the son with a withered arm. My dear fellow, the captain waved it away. Anybody can paint a picture. Paintings lie. I want a photograph of the boy. There was no photograph. Photography was not a known art in their society. Well, sighed the captain, face twitching. Notice another vocab connection. His face is shaking at this moment. Think of the emotions the captain's dealing with here. Let me talk to a few other citizens. We're getting nowhere. He pointed at a woman. You, she hesitated. Yes, you, come here, ordered the captain. Tell me about this wonderful man you saw yesterday. The woman looked steadily at the captain. He walked among us and was very fine and good. What color were his eyes? The color of the sun, the color of the sea, the color of a flower, the color of the mountains, the color of the night. That'll do. The captain threw up his hands. See, Martin, absolutely nothing. Some charlatan, some fraud, some con, con artist, wanders through whispering sweet nothings in their ears and... Please, stop it, said Martin. The captain stepped back. What? You heard what I said, said Martin. I like these people. I believe what they say. You're entitled to your opinions, but keep it to yourself, sir. You can't talk to me this way, shouted the captain. I've had enough of your high-handedness, replied Martin. Leave these people alone. They've got something good and decent, and you come and foul up the nest and sneer at it. Well, I've talked to them, too. I've come through the city and seen their faces, and they've got something you'll never have, a little simple faith, and they'll move mountains with it. You, you're boiled because, somebody, because someone stole your act, got here ahead and made you unimportant. I'll give you five seconds to finish, remarked the captain. I understand. You've been under a strain, Martin. Months of traveling in space, nostalgia, loneliness. And now, with this thing happening, I sympathize, Martin. I overlook your petty insubordination. I don't overlook your petty tyranny, replied Martin. I'm stepping out. I'm staying here. You can't do that. Can't I? Try and stop me. This is what I came looking for. I didn't know it, but this is it. This is for me. Take your filth somewhere else and foul up other nets with your doubt and your scientific method. He looked swiftly about. These people have had an experience, and you can't seem to get it through your head that it's really happened and we were lucky enough to almost arrive in time to be in on it. People on Earth have talked about this man for 20 centuries. That's 2,000 years, just as a, as a clue for you there. After he walked through the old world, we've all wanted to see him and hear him and never had the chance. And now, today, we've just missed seeing him by a few hours. Captain Hart looked at Martin's cheeks. You're crying like a baby. Stop it. I don't care. Well, I do. In front of these natives, we're to keep up a front. You're overwrought. As I said, I forgive you. I don't want your forgiveness. You idiot. Can't you see this is one of Burton's tricks to fool these people, to bilk them, to establish his oil and mineral concerns under a religious guise? You fool, Martin. You absolute fool. You should know Earthmen by now. They'll do anything. Blaspheme, lie, cheat, steal, kill to get their ends. Anything's fine if it works. The true pragmatist, that's Burton. You know him. 
captain scoffed heavily. Come off it, Martin. Admit it. This is the sort of scaly thing Burton might carry off. Polish up these citizens and pluck them when they're ripe. No, said Martin, thinking of it. The captain put his hand up. That's Burton. That's him. That's his dirt. That's his criminal way. You have to, I have to admire the old dragon, flaming in here in a blaze and a halo and a soft word and a loving touch, with a medicated salve here and a healing ray there. That's Burton, all right. No. Martin's voice was dazed. He covered his eyes. No, I won't believe it. You don't want to believe. Captain Hart kept at it. Admit it now. Admit it. It's just the thing Burton would do. Stop daydreaming, Martin. Wake up. It's morning. This is a real world, and we're real dirty people. Burton the dirtiest of us all. Martin turned away. There, there, Martin, said Hart, mechanically patting the man's back. I understand. Quite a shock for you, I know. A rotten shame and all that. That Burton is a rascal. You go take it easy. Let me handle this. Martin walked off slowly toward the rocket. Captain Hart watched, them, watched him go. Then, taking a deep breath, he turned to the woman he had been questioning. Well, tell me some more about this man. As you were saying, madam... It's a good place to pause and think a little bit about character and plot. We've just seen this really dramatic scene. I hope you guys have noticed how the action is ramping up, especially between Martin and Hart. Notice that Martin is a dynamic character. The same timid Martin, very gentle, very peaceable guy from the beginning of the story, has all of a sudden talked back to his captain. Captain Hart's kind of a scary, intimidating dude, and here Martin has stood up for himself. He said, no, Captain, I'm staying here. I'm done listening to you, right? Notice that Martin is changing because of the experiences that he's having on this different planet. That does line up with the plot, right? So our plot conflict started out with these men being confused as to why no one came out to, to see their rocket. We found out as part of the rising action that it's because of this man who's come to the planet a day before um, and kind of stolen their glory. Well, they've come to find out that this man has done miraculous things. He's healed the sick. He's spoken with the poor. These, uh, this planet has been waiting for this man for hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of years. It's a very special event. What we find out um, between Hart and Martin here is that Martin believes these people and wants to be with these people. Hart cannot believe it. He thinks that one of his competitors, Captain Burton of another ship, has gotten there before them and has stolen their glory. So notice how the action's rising up in this story. One more page to get to where we need to go. Later, so notice a time jump here, our setting changes a little bit. Later, the officers of the rocket ship ate supper on card tables outside. The captain correlated his data to a silent Martin, who sat red-eyed and brooding over his meal. Notice Martin's emotional state. This, this day has put him on a roller coaster emotionally. Interviewed three dozen people, all of them full of the same milk and hogwash, said the captain. It's Burton's work, all right, and positive. He'll be spilling back in here tomorrow or next week to consolidate his miracles and beat us out in our contracts. I think I'll stick on and spoil it for him. Martin glanced up sullenly. I'll kill him, he said. Now, now, Martin, there, there, boy. I'll kill him, so help me I will. We'll put an anchor on his wagon. You have to admit he's clever. Unethical, but clever. He's dirty. You must promise not to do anything violent. Captain Hart checked his figures. According to this, there were 30 miracles of healing performed, a blind man restored to visit, vision, a leper cured. Oh, Burton's efficient, given that. A gong sounded, crash. A moment later, a man ran up. Captain, sir, a report. Burton's ship is coming down. Also, the Ashley ship, sir. See, Captain Hart at the table. Here come the jackals to the harvest. They can't wait to feed. Wait till I confront them. I'll make them cut me in on this feast, I will. Martin looked sick. He stared at the captain. Business, my dear boy, business, said the captain. Everybody looked up. Two rockets swung down out of the sky. When the rockets landed, they almost crashed. What's wrong with those fools, cried the captain, jumping up. The men ran across the Meadowlands to the steaming ships. The captain arrived. The airlock door popped open on Burton's ship. A man fell out onto their arms. What's wrong, cried Captain Hart. And that's the cliffhanger we'll end up on today. So just a little recap of a couple of things we covered here. Plot-wise, we're somewhere in our rising action. Um, we are actually very close to the climax or turning point of this story. So keep an eye out for that in our next lesson. Character-wise, we still have Hart and Martin. Um, once again, Martin is definitely dynamic. He's gone through this emotional roller coaster. And notice how um, his personality is changing a little bit. He's actually stood up to his captain a little bit here. This experience is definitely 
is, the experience is definitely making him think and feel some different things. Setting-wise, um, we've learned a little bit about this city, that it's very peaceable. This planet's a peaceful place. I will tell you right now that does connect to who this man is and the, ultimately the theme of this story. Some things to watch out for. Oh, and once again, point of view wise, we're looking through the third person limited perspective. Ray Bradbury does that on purpose in order to keep, uh, a, to, in order to keep the identity of this mysterious man mysterious and so that we don't know automatically. But I hope you're picking up on some of the symbolism here. Um, some of the details about this man might suggest to you who he is. We'll talk about that more in our next lesson along with theme. You guys have been great. Um, we'll finish the rest of this story in our next lesson, and we'll discuss its meaning as well, whether you are in class or virtual. Have a good weekend.